may be seated. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Today, we're going to talk about the Old Testament exclusively. And we're going to study Jesus in the Old Testament. Not so much a study as it is just looking at the different passages in the Old Testament that really point to Jesus. And that's when we come to realize that the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, are all about Jesus Christ. Today, we are so blessed to have the complete written word of God at our fingertips. The Holy Bible has been translated into every language. And Bible apps for smartphones allow you to pull up scripture simply by putting up a familiar phrase on the screen or subject. The early church lacked the whole written word of God. The early Gentile believers in particular had no access or knowledge of Hebrew scriptures at all. In fact, that was even difficult for the Hebrew people. At least they did hear it in synagogue. But the scriptures being handwritten on scrolls were kept in an ark at the synagogue. And it was studied by the teachers and it was studied by the Pharisees and people like that who were the leaders of the people and leaders in the synagogue. <clears throat> Their only reference, especially for these early Christian believers, were the handwritten copies of letters of Luke and the apostles. And most of these were originally written many years after the ascension of Christ. Much of their faith was based on the stories of elders who were eyewitnesses to Jesus' teaching and the miracles he performed. And also, many had seen him alive after his resurrection from the dead. It wasn't until much later that there was access to the Hebrew scriptures by Christian scholars who studied these books and found that Christ the Messiah was the main focus of the Hebrew text as well. A Google search that I did came up with 351 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, which really astounded me. I didn't think there was that many. Of course, this person kind of split hairs too. They would take something like, uh, say, Isaiah 53, and they would have each verse listed as a prophecy, which it is. That's, pretty, that's really a fair thing to say. It is said that uh, St. Jerome in the year 325 A.D. was the first to combine the Hebrew scriptures with the Gospels and Epistles to form the Old and New Testament. Now there are 39 books in the Old Testament written over a span of 1,500 years from around 2000 B.C. to 400 B.C. by at least 20 plus writers under divine inspiration of God. From all of these writings dwells a common theme woven in, the coming of a redeemer to the Hebrew people. Now, when you think about that many authors over the span of that long a period of time, the first thing that comes to mind is the Bible is such a perfect book. How in the world 
could there be this perfection in a book with so many authors over such a span of time? And the only, act, the only thing you can conclude is this is this inspiration of God. God inspired these men to write these things down. When we read this, these men were not the authors of the Bible. They were the writers of God's Word. God is the author of the Bible. So the Bible in itself, all alone, Old and New Testament, is a miracle that's just astounding. And we sometimes, I think, we kind of lose sight of that. We don't realize what a mir miracle book this is. There's a reason why it's the most published book ever in the history of the world and published in every language of the world. Let me find my place here again. This is a powerful tool we have today to turn aside the arguments of skeptics when we are questioned about our faith. But it's a worthy tool only if we are willing to study the Old Testament and learn of these wonderful prophecies. All these writers of 39 books over a period of 1,500 years and no one can make a credible argument disavowing their truth. In these texts, we read of the powerful acts of creation by God, God's promise to giving Moses uh, promises Abraham that he would be a father to many nations. God choosing Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery and giving Moses the law, the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, these prophecies become reality with the birth of our Savior, the story of his earthly ministry, crucifixion and resurrection, and finally, his ascension to heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God the Father. So what we're going to do I'm going to get the study Bible out here. We're going to look at some, not just a few of these prophecies. Now, I can't look at all of them because there's just too many. But we're going to, I just chose a few that I thought kind of stood out. And the first one we want to look at, of course, is Genesis 3.15. And uh, I think everybody's familiar with that. This is right after uh, Adam and Eve have been tempted to eat of the, the fruit of the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when Eve tells God that it was the serpent that tempted her to do this, and God curses the serpent. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, a lot of people, I've had people tell me, well, that proves us right there that we're supposed to kill every snake we ever see. Of course, that's not what it means at all. But in, the, in this study Bible here, there's a good, a good rundown on this verse. It says, Satan is our enemy. He will do anything he can to get us to follow his evil, deadly path. The phrase, you will strike his heel, refers to Satan's repeated attempts to defeat Christ during his life on earth. He will crush your head for shadows Satan's defeat when Christ rose from the dead. A strike on the heel is not deadly, but a blow to the head is already, is. already God was revealing his plan to defeat Satan and offer salvation to the world through his son, Jesus Christ. So that really is amazing. I, it was just a few years ago that I finally understood what this verse meant. I always had been kind of wondered about it, but Right here, in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, just three chapters in, we've already got a prophecy about Christ, about how God is going to reconcile the world to him. <clears throat> the next scripture we're going to look at is in Job. Now, Job is a, a book you think, well, we're going to find a prophecy about Jesus in Job? But there is one, it's so. Very, I've never, never really noticed it before until we started studying Job in Sunday school. And we talked about this in Sunday school a while back. And it's a verse we're probably all familiar with. When you, and when you think about it, it's a perfect, perfect prophecy about Jesus. Job 19, and this is 25 through 27. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, 
yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. At the heart of the book of Job comes his ringing affirmation of confidence. I know that my Redeemer lives. In ancient Israel, a Redeemer was a family member who brought, who brought a slave's way to freedom or who took care of a widow. What tremendous faith Job had, especially in light of the fact that he was unaware of the conference between God and Satan. Job thought that God had brought all these disasters upon him. Faced with death and decay, Job still expected to see God, and he expected to do so in his body. <clears throat> when the book of Job was written, Israel did not have a well-developed doctrine of the resurrection. Although Job struggled with the idea that God was presently against him, he firmly believed that in the end God would be on his side. This belief was so strong that Job became one of the first to talk about the resurrection of the body. What struck me in, in what he says here is he says, I will see God in the flesh. So he's, this falls back to what Paul teaches in Thessalonians, that we will be raptured out of here when Christ returns for, the, for that time, and we will receive new bodies. And it is it's a spiritual body, but it's also a body of flesh, because when, God, I mean, when Jesus appeared to the apostles after his resurrection, he ate food with them. A spirit doesn't eat food. And he told them, touch, he told Thomas, he touched touch these holes and, you know, the place of the wounds on my hand and thrust your hand into my side. He was showing Thomas, who had doubted up that time, that I'm here. I'm resurrected from the dead and, and I have a body. And so because of this, we all now have this same hope. And Jesus has done this for us and and uh, right here in, jo in Job, thousands of years before the time of Christ, we have this perfect picture of Job seeing God in the flesh. next one we're going to look at is Psalms 22, 16 through 18. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Just think of that. The hands of Jesus and his feet were pierced when he was nailed to that cross. This is Jesus speaking right here. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And we know that that's what they did when they took Jesus' robe. They cast lots for it. They gambled to see who would get it. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horn of the wild oxen. Well, I went a little further on there, but I thought this was all fell in there. This is Jesus being man and God. He couldn't help but feel despair at this time. But at the same time, he knew what the final outcome would be. Okay, next we're going to go to Isaiah. Uh, I think Isaiah, the thing we learn in Isaiah, this, almost the entire book of Isaiah is about Jesus. A lot of, there's parts of it that are about Israel and uh, the dealings with the kings that during Isaiah's time. But it also has verse after verse that talk about Jesus, about the coming Redeemer. And it, it's so graphic in its description sometimes that you wonder why people, when they see this, and realize this was done long before Christ appeared on earth. It's, it's really amazing. The very first one I picked out in Isaiah 
Isaiah, Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Now we all know that Jesse was the father of King David. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. In this study Bible, there's a really good commentary on, on these verses. <clears throat> Judah, the royal line of David, would be like a tree. That's when he talks about the, the stump. Chopped down to a stump. From that stump, a new shoot will grow, the Messiah. He would be greater than the original tree and would bear much fruit. The Messiah is the fulfillment of God's promise that a descendant of David would rule forever. And that's, that's another great... Just, Isaiah is just full of this wonderful knowledge about Jesus, these prophecies. Let's go to Isaiah 7.14. This is another one I think we're all familiar with. <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And we all know what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel means God with us. So here's another great prophecy about Jesus. Because we know that he was born of a virgin. He was born in, in Bethlehem. Which was also prophesied in the Old Testament. The slaying of the children of Bethlehem. When... King Herod, in his wickedness, realized that there would be this man coming up to go against his family for leadership. He decides to destroy all the, the children under two years of age, all the, all the male children. And, of course, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to, to uh, Joseph, his earthly father, and told him, flee out of here, go to Egypt. And that, so they did. But this is this is a, another wonderful, wonderful prophecy, and it's, it's to me it's astounding. <clears throat> the last place we're going to go is to probably the greatest <coughs> description of Jesus Christ that there is in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53. And I know we've all read Isaiah 53, but we'll go through it again because it's it's beautiful. Isaiah says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. I think that best describes the, the lowly position of, of birth of Jesus. He was, he was a king. He is God. And yet he had this very lowly birth in a stable with farm animals and placed in a manger comforted with straw who would have thought of a king being born under such circumstances 
I think that's what's revealed. He says when he grew up a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. In other words, he, was, he looked like any other ordinary man, any other Hebrew man. There was nothing special about him that, that, that people would say, oh, isn't he good looking or is, doesn't he have a fine way of speaking? It was just, he was an ordinary looking man. Nothing special, not like a king. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. And we think about the pain on the cross, but there was also the pain in the life of Jesus all through his ministry. His heart, the heart of God, was for the people of Israel to accept him as their Messiah. Of course, he knew they wouldn't. But Christ, being both man and God at the same time, he had the same feelings that we would have when we're rejected. This is pain and suffering. It's not physical pain, but it's pain of the, of the mind. It's grieving. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Even when he went to preach in his hometown, he was rejected, and that brought on more pain. He had to be grieved over that. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. And this is the part I think that a lot of people really can see things. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. That really, to me, is very profound. That, that God would have his only son suffer and die and bleed on that cruel cross because he loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his own son to redeem us, to free us, to give us liberty from sin. Not that we'll never sin again, but it says in the, in the New Testament, in the Holy Scriptures from Paul, it says that God will never tempt you above what you can stand. He will always give you the way out. Now, whether we choose the way out or not is up to us. Because the Holy Spirit knows, it tells us when we're going to do something that we shouldn't do. The Holy Spirit pricks your ear and says, you know you shouldn't do this. But that way out is always there. It's up to us to choose whether we want to do what God would want or what we want to do. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's so true that we, we tend to be so focused on ourselves sometimes that the only thing we care about is what's going to be for our good. We don't think about the good of others or whether our actions might hurt other people. Sometimes we don't even think about those things until they happen. Then we feel bad about it. So we're not capable of living this perfect life that Jesus lived. We need a Savior. We need a perfect Lamb. A perfect Lamb. So Jesus his whole time during his earthly ministry before the crucifixion. He lived under the law that he, God, had created. And he obeyed the law to perfection. He never broke any commandment of God the Father. And because of this, only his sacrifice would be sufficient. We see that in, in the Old Testament, and especially when the first time at the Passover, when they're told to sacrifice a lamb, and they said it had to be a perfect lamb, a male lamb. And the blood of that lamb had to be posted on the, the doorways above the, the home so that the angel of death would pass over that place. And this was so symbolic 
of Jesus, our perfect lamb of sacrifice. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And when he went before, when he was accused by his own brethren and brought before Pilate, because they wanted Pilate to pass a, an edict of execution on him, they wanted him killed. They couldn't, they couldn't do it because they could not kill anyone under Roman rule without authorization of some type. So there was also the, the Sabbath uh, was coming, and they, had to get, they tried to get this done before the Sabbath. And so they brought him before Pilate. And Pilate was amazed that Jesus never opened his mouth to defend himself. I know if you were if any of us were dragged into a court and wrongly accused of something, we'd be saying a lot. We'd be protesting that we're innocent. But Jesus was not going to protest his innocence because this is what he came on earth to do. To die for us. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And yet, who of his generation protested? When they speak of his generation, they're talking about his brethren, the Hebrew people. They didn't protest him being taken away. They were out shouting, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We want him dead. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. That's when he was crucified. And he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And we know that's another prophecy there because normally a person crucified, when they were taken down, they just would have been thrown in some common grave somewhere. In other words, a grave of the poor. But two men... And these were men, I, I know one was Nicodemus. They had provided the money and the place for Jesus to be properly entombed. And I know they did it secretly because we know for a fact Nicodemus was a, I believe he was a Pharisee or he was a teacher. I'm not sure which. But we think we pretty well know that he had become a believer in Jesus as the Messiah and so he wanted to do something and so they provided and I think that's where the, the funds came for the oil and other things that were needed for Jesus proper burial and so he was given a, the tomb of a rich man so another prophecy fulfilled Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering, and, <clears throat> and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So that right there speaks of the resurrection. It says, even though he has died and buried, he will see his offspring, and we are his offspring. We are the children of God when we believe. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we are now his adopted children. So we become the, the offspring of God. So he did see, he, we does see his offspring now. He sees everyone who has accepted his sacrifice on the cross as a punishment for their sins. After he had suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. He will see the light of life again, his resurrection. And 
for all eternity he will bear our iniquities and the scars in his body. Just like that he showed the, the scars to Thomas when Thomas doubted. We know that Jesus will bear these scars for eternity. And he is our intercessor between our high priest between us and God the Father. He makes intercession for us all the time. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And I think that's all self-explanatory when we look at that. And I've heard that that many people, people who were devout Jews, they've said that they never read Isaiah 53 in, in the synagogue because I think it's too difficult for them to deal with. And many of them, when they hear it for the first time, they know that Christ is their Messiah and they change and they get saved. And then when they do that, they become real Jews, the real children of God. God always said that it would be a remnant that would believe. And he also said, Jesus said in his ministry, he said there are other sheep and when he spoke of these other sheep, he was speaking of us, the Gentiles. you got to remember, back in that time, the Hebrew people, they looked upon us Gentiles as unclean. They wouldn't even want to be in the same room with you because they would, you were not the chosen people of God like they were. To them, you were nothing. And... But Jesus even spoke about us Gentiles even before his crucifixion. He said, there are other sheep. And he said, and they will listen to me. And they will listen to me because they're not puffed up with the pride that so many of the Jewish people were. They, they put all of, their, all of their heart into being God's chosen people and became prideful, which God knew they would that's why he chose them to start with. They were the chosen people because he was going to show them that all people are the same. And the best way to do that is you pick one and say, okay, you're the chosen people. And what do they do? They get puffed up with pride. And their pride is their downfall. So when their Messiah did come, because he wasn't this conquering hero that they expected, you know, driving the Romans out, they didn't accept him. And they proved they were just like everybody else. So, to conclude this, I would just encourage everybody to read Isaiah sometime. Just go ahead and start. It's a long book of the Bible, one of the longest. Not as long as Psalms, I don't think, but it's long. But it's so full of these prophecies about our Lord Jesus and I think it's a, it's a strong argument that you can use if somebody says, well, I don't go to church. Well, I don't really believe this. I don't believe that. The Bible's full of all kinds of contradictions, and we know that it's not. People like to say that because God has dealt with us differently through, from generation to generation. We've had, there was the time of innocence, Adam and Eve. And then when there was the time of the judges, when the, Jews were ruled by the judges and they demanded a king and so then you had the king and you had all this time after Moses they lived under the law and like we've said before the only reason the law was given, given was to show us how we couldn't follow it how we're all failures at following God's law so many people look at these contradictions and, and they look at the way we act sometime when we don't display good Christian character which I'm sure all of us do it sometime we don't mean to but we do it anyway 
and they use this excuse not to believe in we've just got to be try to be strong in our faith read our Bibles and study Christ in the Old Testament I think it's very very important I've heard some some preachers say that the best way to, to teach people about Jesus is to teach to him teach him out of the Old Testament because there's where you find all this wonderful prophecy about him coming so Heavenly Father Father we thank you for this time here in church together today Lord our gathering of it's a small gathering Father but it's a good one and we know that that just because a church has a giant congregation doesn't mean that they're any better than a small church like this one with a small congregation. So, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, which is an instruction for us, Father. And we pray that we keep this word in our hearts and dwell on it and that we continue to study your word, Father, and to, to listen to the Holy Spirit. If we're quiet and pray, the Holy Spirit does speak to us. So, Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for everybody that's here today, Father. We pray all this in the name of our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.